Um, so I'd like to say a little bit, do some practice, say a little bit, and then we can end the recording and open it up um, for conversation, reflections, and shared wisdom. Um, perhaps as just a check-in, I know not everyone is even on video, um, but uh, for those who have video or who can write into the chat, um, if there's any you know words that you could either say or write um, that reflect how you're showing up. Um, yeah, just a word or two or three. I think about mine. Hmm. And welcome to folks who continue to arrive. Just inviting folks to share a few words. Um, so we have one person coming in with pebble sunshine, another anxious about work, and coming in with some contentment, mm, sadness over close relatives, terminal health condition, scattered. Grateful to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Well, grateful for everyone to be here as you're able and when you're able to. Um, it's the nice thing about Zoom, you really can come and go as it works. And seeing a new friend arrive with Suzanne, welcome too. So I want to start with some stories. Um, one of them you may be familiar with. And so if you are already familiar with the story of the Buddha's awakening, um, the invitation is to see if you can hear it with fresh ears. I know when I hear stories over and over again, Thich Nhat Hanh was prone to tell the same stories many, 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 many times. <laughs> What, what ended up being most fruitful was when I would just get to ask myself like, oh, and so how am I actually practicing with this? Or how am I applying this? Um, and if anything is new, then please just receive as much and however you want to receive it and let the rest go in case anything feels a little too much to grasp or to remember all the details. So there's nothing, there's no tests here. There's nothing to, nothing to hold on to. Um, and so whenever posture is comfortable and feels good for you, you can lie down, you can stand, you can sit. If you need to move a little bit to stretch your body, please really just take good care. So legend has it that the Buddha, um, after many years of deep ascetic practice, he got to the point where he was so thin because he was living off of one grain of rice a day, trying to quench and, and um, really repress any sensual desire as a, as a pathway to liberation, because that's what some folks in his time thought would work. Um, he got so thin that he could, it said that when he tried to touch his stomach, he could feel his spine. He was so thin and so emaciated and had gone to such an extreme. After having been born and raised in the opposite extreme of opulence, of riches, of deep central pleasure, and, uh, you know, today would say incredible privilege. Um, so for many years, he tried to, to find this elusive freedom and pushed himself to the brink, to the brink of death, really. And one day he realized he had this memory of being a child and sitting under a rose apple tree. And he realized, wait a minute, I experienced a pleasure at that moment, but that was entirely wholesome. That was liberated contentment or pleasure. What if that's the path to freedom and not this deep restraint and repression that I've been practicing. 
And so he completely changed how he was practicing. His friends thought that he had gone soft, they abandoned him. And there was this young girl named Sujata who saw him practicing and was very moved and brought him rice milk or rice pudding, um, which was said to be luxurious or um, yeah, luxurious food. So typically not fitting for a renunciate in those days. But he received this sweetness, this kindness, and he started to restore his strength. And he made this resolve, I will not move from under this Bodhi tree until I have found the, the fullness of this awakening that I've been seeking in so many ways. So kind of skip forward and, and some stories say that he stayed there for 49 days, some for three days, some versions that it was one full day. You can take your pick, which version speaks more to your heart. Um, and in the classical stories, there's quite a scene that goes down in this final night before the Buddha's full awakening. And each tradition has a little bit of a different version. So again, you might know a different version than what I'm going to share, but they all have a pretty similar flow. As the Buddha is practicing and practicing and just cultivating this deep concentration, this full awareness, this inquiry, this subtle, subtle ability to be with everything as it arises and passes. Mara shows up. I'm just going to check because it actually, I wonder if Walt, if you're also able to mute yourself. Um, just seeing who else is unmuted. Thank you. Um, so Mara shows up. And sometimes Mara is compared to like the Buddhist version of Satan. It's not actually a an appropriate um, connection, but you know, will probably be the closest that we can um, explain really quickly for those unfamiliar with Mara. Mara's more the personification of distraction, of greed and hatred, and, and everything that blocks our mind from its capacity to awaken. And so Mara shows up and it's like, no, this, this can't happen. If the Buddha gets awakened, then I won't have control here. And so the so Mara starts sending in every single temptation and distraction that he can find to try to sway the Buddha from this full awakening that's happening. And at one point, Mara sends his three beautiful daughters to tempt the Buddha with their dances and their beauty. Um, and it said that the Buddha just remained still, unmoved. And eventually they sort of gave up and said, well, fine, you know, sexual desire is not gonna sway him. And then Mara says, well, what if I send my armies? And so these armies arrive. And in some of the stories, they're, set, they're set, you know, firing arrows upon the Buddha to try to defeat him. Mara's trying to defeat the Buddha. And that as the arrows reach the Buddha, they turn into flowers and they cause no harm. And eventually Mara just has to give up. And at the final, but in the final moment before giving up, Mara says, by what right do you have to awaken? Who's here to witness you? Who's here to, to validate this awakening you claim to have? Because I don't believe you. And the Buddha raised one hand in this kind of posture of touching the index finger to the thumb and the other three fingers upraised. And with the other hand, you may have seen this called the earth touching mudra. With the other hand, he touched the earth. He said, By the, as the earth is my witness, I have attained complete awakening. And Mara is defeated, Mara scuttles away. And the Buddha has, is said to have um, understood the workings of karma, all of his past lives, he gains complete omniscience. It's, it's pretty spectacular. I mean, when I look at the story, it's basically a Marvel comic, you know, it's like, we have different planes of existence going on, we have fabulous powers, we have this warfare, we have everything going on. And if you've ever seen images depicting this, it's, it's pretty fantastical. 
it's pretty amazing. And so every time I'd heard this story, I was going to say growing up in my in my years of, of learning and practicing the Dharma, what I felt was um, emphasized was this quality of the Buddha's unshakability. Nothing could touch him. And there have been many, many times in my practice where that has not been how I felt. I have felt shaken and moved and broken and shattered and just wobbly uh, as the world's arrows and temptations and hardships and, and the doubt of who are you, who are you to awaken have come through. So that I was reflecting on this story, I think it was a few months ago, and I had this moment of going, wait a minute, what if there's a whole other way to read this story? Because, you know, if the, if the Buddha was really completely unaffected, how would Mara even send his daughters and his armies and show up? What if the Buddha's awakening didn't come from sort of having this protective force field that grew up around him, but by actually just staying present as all the worldly vicissitudes, the ups and downs, the terror, the fear, the desire, the doubt was assailing him. What if he actually felt all of these things and his awakening came through staying present, but not unaffected? And this image of a human Buddha actually being afflicted just like you and me started to work its way into my heart and it started to give me a different depth of faith in my own capacity for practice and it resonated with my own small moments of awakening and practice times when i was quaking or feeling like i was drowning in grief i remember um Actually, as I was preparing to leave to go to the monastery, I was living outside of Toronto, um, 2010. And just the act of breaking up with my partner and leaving my job and my family, I was so happy to get to go take this, this journey. Um, and yet I was so heartbroken uh, to leave so many beloveds and to especially to cause a lot of pain to my partner that I, I was leaving. Um, and I remember one day sitting in a goodbye, a goodbye party with Sangha friends and we were meditating together and I, the heartbreak was so intense. I actually, I, I didn't quite cough, but like my lungs felt like they were filled and I had this image of a waterfall bearing down. I felt like I was drowning in this sorrow. And fortunately, because I was with Sangha in practice, and I had been trying to push this feeling of drowning, push it away, push it away. And by some, I would say miracle, or some sort of uh, grace, I stopped fighting that feeling of drowning in the sorrow. And inside myself, I just said, fine, drown me, go for it. I'm not gonna fight this pain anymore. And I felt incredible physical pain for a few minutes as this intensity kind of washed through and I felt I could find where my diaphragm was just clenched, trying to hold back the ache in my chest. And somehow the, the body softened and this energy and this pain just moved through me. And within a few minutes, it cleared. And I realized that that was my earth touching mudra. That was my, okay, fine. Mara's arrows, uh, come, I'm not gonna defend myself. I'm just gonna let it happen. And by staying present with it, not fighting back, staying very attentive. There's a, a small moment of awakening. And then four months after that, my mother actually died. And this became my practice okay, go ahead, drown me, grief. 
of not fighting the dukkha. And when I try to remember the conceptual teachings of no birth and no death, of, of, of non-self, of interbeing, I just got really mad. <laughs> I, it wasn't at that, in that moment, it wasn't helpful for me. But when I just let myself surrender to the painful experience, let it happen and stay really present and curious every time it moved through. And I imagine you have all your own versions of this, small and large. And through the years, I've come to find that, oh, actually, rage works the same. And doubt works the same. And fear works the same. It builds and builds until I feel like I'm burning <laughs> or being crushed. And in the moment I stop fighting, but just let myself be with it with no resistance. I can't always fake my way into that. It usually has to come with some sort of pretty intense struggle that then has a surrender because I've been fighting it and I stopped fighting it through some sort of desperation and blessing and, and just being willing to stay with the arrows and the temptations and Mara saying, who do you think you are to think you can do this? And it changes and passes. And, and so because of these experiences, I started to look at the story of the Buddha's night of awakening differently. I said, what, what if what happened to me wasn't that different from what happened to the Buddha? And not to say that I, I've mastered all the states of jhanas and, and attained the same fully liberating um, insights of the historical Buddha. It's not what I mean to say. But there's something about when I imagine the Buddha's awakening is so different and distant from my own experiences, it kind of just gets more and more distant. It feels like, oh, well, that's, that's amazing for some people, but I could never do that. And in this shift of what if he was actually much more human than the stories, the legends got passed down, the myths. Um, and I use the word myth with reverence, not to say, oh, it's a story that's made up, but a story that touches the truth so deep that it goes beyond historical uh, truths. And that this, this staying with and being willing to face everything that arises, that's where our freedom comes from. And we don't come by it easily. And then there's this, this beautiful earth touching mudra of, well, the ground that holds me, the very cosmos itself is all the witness that I need. Earth itself, nature itself, the fact of being alive and part of this, this flow of life, the stream of existence that is that is enough. Don't need to fight back the doubt, but we just find another source, a deeper, stronger source, a validation of, of confidence. And so with these stories in our heart, mind streams, you, know, you I, I first want us to to just try what is it like to, to let ourselves hold this earth touching mudra and you might actually try raising your right hand and touching the index finger to the thumb and if you're on a chair sometimes i just touch my other hand to the chair as a representative of the ground and if you can touch to some sort of ground like surface see what that does in your body this is that posture that the Buddha made that we aren't so different? What if we can have the same awakenings, the same insights, the same confidence, courage, persistence? 
that leaves us unshakable, not because we put up a force field that blocks out the world, but because we're willing to meet all that the world throws at us and all that arises from within and just stay and let it pass. And you might enjoy this posture. There might be something in it that resonates in your body where you feel maybe some more strength or some collectedness. But you might want to also try a different posture. Is there something else that you could do either with your hands or your body that gets you in touch with a sense of capacity to meet whatever arises fearless and yet still human knowing that everything arises and passes and give ourselves the gift of letting our bodies breathe sit or lie or stand in a posture of dignity and capacity. And from here, I wanna invite us into a period of practice. You can do it sitting, lying, standing, Eyes open, closed, screens on or off, whatever is supportive for you to find a nice balance of wakefulness and easefulness, of relaxation and alert, awake attention, softening a little bit more and maybe uplifting a little bit more. And so in this practice, right away, you may still be feeling some ripples, some glimmers of this posture, these mudra gestures. You may still be feeling whatever it is that you brought in from your day. Stressors, sweetness, worries, busyness. And what would it be like to let yourself meet what arises right now? Tiredness, boredom, strange memories, numbness. And if you want, you can even make the earth touching mudra or your earth touching mudra when you wish, or just tune into it energetically within. Letting yourself be willing to feel what you feel. Not unmoved and cold like a statue. but a living, breathing being, willing to let it all happen and knowing it will arise and fade away, knowing that the earth is your witness, is our witness. By the very fact of being alive as humans, We have the capacity and the right to awaken, to find small and large moments of freedom from stress and suffering and pain, to enjoy and savor the pauses and the gaps between the hard times, the painful times. So if 
you'd like to rest your attention into an anchor that may be body sensations, the contact with the ground. It may be listening to sounds arise and fade away. Maybe the sensations of breath. Let yourself collect attention. That's one translation of samadhi to just open and gently collect attention. So that when it's ready, invite it to rest in this anchor. And it's bound to move and change. I like the image of an anchor because when I think of a boat that's anchored, it is not still, but it has a solid place to, that keeps drawing it back and it floats away and draws back and then it goes in the direction, comes back. So we're just moving and returning to our center. And then from time to time, I'm just going to pop in and offer a few words like, as the earth is our witness. And what would it be like to meet whatever is happening, especially anything that feels like it is in the way of our practice? Let those be the arrows and the dancers and Mara's question and doubt. And put ourselves too in this epic tale of awakening. We're sitting there right next to the Buddha. Arrows shooting at us of regret and planning. Okay. Let them come and just by willingly letting them come, they turn into flowers by blessing them and meeting them with kindness as opposed to fear or hatred. And in the gaps between the difficulties and distractions, can we just stay with touching that earth, that stability? Savoring the stability. When it arises, letting it move on when it passes. So we'll practice mostly in silence for the next 20 minutes or so with occasional prompts. Resting awareness in a chosen anchor. Allowing ourselves like the Buddha 
on that night of awakening to, to meet whatever arises and fades away with this earth touching mudra, with this willingness and confidence. Meeting this moment, a little more curiosity and courage and kindness, channeling the strength of the earth.
relaxing a little more, waking up a little more, finding our own expression of the earth touching mudra. Returning to this moment, to the anchor, and whatever felt like it was in the way of being present, what if those are Mara's arrows that we can meet with an earth touching mudra? Meet it with kindness and it turns into a flower.
If there's a sense of fatigue, can that too be met? Like everything else, curiosity and kindness and courage, maybe taking some deeper breaths, just a few. And if there's still activation and a lot of busyness in the mind, can that also be met as, as arrows? As Mara trying to, trying to tempt us with doubt. Maybe smoothing out the breath, slowing it down just a little bit. For a few breaths to to moderate our energy levels. We don't have to be unmoved, unfeeling towards whatever is happening. We can choose to respond. Just these next few minutes in silence. The last few minutes of this formal practice, continuing to let an experience flow through. Getting in touch one more time with trust, trusting one's capacity to meet this moment, 
trusting that everything the Buddha taught is possible. Trusting that the earth is always holding us and so there's nothing we have to face alone. Letting each moment of dukkha or suffering and each moment of cessation or freedom from dukkha all be precious gifts, precious opportunities to understand the workings of the heart mind in order to grow liberation. And if I'll share a little bit more, if the recording can continue, um, you might want to bring movement into your body. And can this earth touching mudra continue in movement? You might want to open eyes if they've been closed or turn on cameras if they've been off, but do whatever supports you. So we aren't suddenly, oh, that's done, next. But letting, letting there be continuation, continuity of awareness, of presence. And I just want to add a few more reflections before we open this up. Um, one, making a connection. I don't know if any of you were here last week, but last week I spoke about the Four Noble Truths in daily life as a chance to notice where there's resistance as the first and the second noble truth, especially. And where is their relief? These moments of cessation, of suffering are to be savored. And when there is distress and stress, it's the pushing it away or trying to make it different from the inside. That's the resistance that causes and strengthens the suffering. And then by not resisting the inner states is how we come to experience the cessation of dukkha. So that's a very short, short form version of my take on the Four Noble Truths. Um, and yet this, this practice tonight was very much a continuation of where, where is the resistance? Where are we not willing to meet and feel our reality? And then when we are willing to just experience that can be a doorway into this, these small moments of Nibbana that lead to, or Nirvana that lead to the larger ones. And last week I was commenting a little bit on the turning of the wheel of the Dhamma Sutta, Chaka Paravatana Sutta. Um, supposedly the Buddha's first teaching where he introduces the middle path and the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path. And if you don't know what those are, don't worry, you don't need to. Um, but often this, that list sounds like a bunch of things to believe in. Um, however, they are instructions. And in particular, I think tonight it connects to the first Noble Truth where the instruction is to understand Dukkha. And this is not a conceptual, analytical kind of understanding that we're invited to cultivate, but rather the understanding comes from feeling fully, from totally experiencing what it's like 
to be in the midst of joy or rage or boredom so that we actually understand it. Oh, this is how it arises, this is how it fades. This is how I feel it in my body. This is how the thought patterns tend to go. Understand it because we have not just lived it and let it run us amok. You know, you could have a lot of rage and not actually learn anything. We can be very exhausted or bored and not learn anything. But when we turn towards the experience and go, how can this moment be a chance to learn, understand the workings of the mind, understand how the dukkha, the suffering arises in order to understand how it releases, then it becomes this parinya, this understanding the dukkha that is the first noble truth. So that's a bit of also what was behind my use of the word willingness, the not resisting. And yet I always feel the need to say, this is not about acquiescing to abuse or oppression or violence, mistreatment. It's not about being willing <laughs> to experience whatever's happening around, but, but the inner experience, the rage that arises, if that's already happening, it's the non-resisting of what's already happening within. Um, that's really important. And I wanted to also make just a little connection to, you know, so much in current neuroscience, trauma therapy keeps pointing to the importance of, of, of experiencing <laughs> and of not being numb. Now, this is not a judgment of the ways that we have learned to numb ourselves, usually through protection, through socialization, as a trauma response. And yet, this whole being capable and willing to experience what we're experiencing actually has profound implications. And it's not meant to be sort of open the floodgates I feel like all the, the Buddha have been practicing for years, we can let ourselves have decades of practice to, to learn to feel a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more to experience the sensations, the thought patterns and not hold them as personal, but as processes of nature. Um, if it's helpful to envision Mara <laughs> coming and sort of inflicting us with the, the painful states. Go ahead and use that, but I know sometimes that feels even still too combative. If I, if I, if the, the doubt and the fear feels like it's, if when I imagine it as Mara sometimes as an outside force that's like challenging and testing me, even that still carries a version in it. And so this like, oh, a chance to understand, a chance to learn what this is like kind of releases some of the aversion for me um, and holding it in this larger field of, I think one of the sort of catchphrases, you have to feel it to heal it. I know that's been true for myself over and over again to, to be capable of experiencing the burning and this drowning and, but also capable of experiencing the delight and staying with it. I mean, to be totally honest, I. You know, I'm no longer a monastic. I'm exploring dating and relationships a little bit. And, you know, last week I was hanging out with somebody and there was some sparks and sparkles. And and my old pattern is like the brain getting fixated upon, well, are we going to do something? Am I going to kiss this person? What are we going to, you know, the futuring and trying to plan and the tightness of it. And I decided, what if? if I just stay and find what's pleasant and and stay in it <laughs> and I have this lovely afternoon of cuddling with someone on a blanket in a park and we stayed totally present and we we're even naming like oh you know when you when you shift and it came a little closer here's what I felt wow I felt that and we were just I mean this isn't going to work with everybody but it was so present and that's the practice too it's not just with the pain it's it's with everything that we can actually just meet a little more fully being willing 
to feel it and stay with it so that it actually passes through is, is I think one of the many places that the Dharma, I don't think it's the same as what psychotherapy teaches and what Western psychology, I think that Western psychology still stays in a sense of the individual self. It's smaller, but the patterns fit within the larger pattern of, of the sort of cosmic truths of the Dharma. Um, so in any case, that's a lot of shares and reflections and thank you for your practice. I am deeply curious what your experience, insights, questions, confusions, frustrations are. <laughs>